Let's start over again. Hallelujah. Good to be here. Hallelujah. It's good to be with you. And um, the message I've got for you today, God gave me several years ago while I was preparing to preach another message. And he told me, he said, this is going to be like the signature message of your life and your ministry. And he said, I want you to preach it wherever God opens up a door. And thank God for this open door. And so I want you to know that for me, I know that today, standing here before you, I'm in the perfect will of God for my life, preaching the message that God wants me to preach. And I know that you're in the perfect will of God for your life. Can you say amen here in this message? And so just a moment, take your Bible with me. Take your Bible, lift it up nice and high. Might be on your phone, might be on a tablet, might be on, uh, maybe you've got Google glasses, I don't know. Maybe you're lifting up your hand by faith. Say, this is my Bible. I love my Bible. It's God's Word. According to me. Sorry. It's God's Word. It's, God. <laughs> it's God. This is my Bible. I love my Bible. It's God's Word. I am who the Bible says I am. I have what the Bible says I have. And I can do what the Bible says I can do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In that Bible, we're going to start off in Genesis chapter 4. Not at the very beginning, but almost the very beginning. Genesis chapter 4, and in verse 26, we all know the story. Cain killed Abel, and his brother killed, killed Abel, his brother, and God now has a problem. God has a problem, and that is that Cain is unrepentant, and that... Uh, Cain, if his, if, his godly, if his ungodly seed is allowed to continue, the world's going to have a problem. And so God comes up with a plan, a plan B, if you will. And in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 26, it says, To Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos, then began, say began. began. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Imagine this. They've never done this before. They, they're starting to do something completely different. Imagine this now. Adam and Eve have been kicked out of the garden for hundreds of years, and nobody's calling upon the name of the Lord. They didn't know to. They only knew God as a historical God. They worshipped him as a historical God. They only knew him as a creator. And God had created many, many years ago. And so they worshipped him only as a creator until God uh, gave somebody a revelation, a God idea, that this historical God, you could actually call out to him. You could call upon his name. And this is a game changer. Say game changer. This is a game changer. This is this guy who got this revelation. He's now a history maker because everything changed from this point on. The, 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 uh, this changed history, the Christianity, the cross, your salvation, this church, your eternity can all be traced back to this verse when men began to call upon the name of the Lord. It all starts here. See, before this, they only knew God as the creator. But now, they have a way to connect with God. And God now has a way to connect with him. With them. See, it, now, if you wanted a relationship with God, you could call upon his name. If you were in need of help, you could now call upon his name. If you were in trouble, if you needed answers in your life, you could now call upon the name of the Lord. This is huge. 
And this is the theme of calling upon the name of the Lord that runs from Genesis to Revelation. The first people that had a connection with God were not called Jews. They certainly weren't called Christians. They were called those who, ca those who call upon the name of the Lord. It's what we were, were known for. We were known for calling upon the name of the Lord. And it follows from Genesis to Revelation. And in fact, in Acts chapter uh, uh, 9, the Bible tells us that there was great persecution. And Saul, who later became Paul, thank God, but Saul is persecuting the church. He's throwing them into prison. And from prison, they were be they're being executed. And this is what the Bible tells us, that the high priest gave Paul, Saul rather, permission, they gave him written permission to arrest all those who call upon the name of the Lord. In the early church, that was the evidence that you were a believer. That was the evidence that you had a connection with God. That was the evidence that you were a Christian. You would, there would be evidence in your life, and the evidence was this, you called upon the name of the Lord. He wasn't arresting those who went to church. He wasn't arresting those who had a Bible. He has permission to arrest those who call upon the name of the Lord. And so the early church was built on this theme of calling upon the name of the Lord. This morning as I was preparing, God said to me, he said, Dale, remember Stephen. He said, Stephen called upon the name of the Lord, and I had to look up in my Bible, the martyr Stephen. And I had to fact check God. Can you say amen? <laughs> and, <laughs> and sure enough, the Bible says that they stoned Stephen who was calling upon the name of the Lord. I don't know about you, but that's how I want to go. <laughs> I, you know, that's how I want to go, calling upon the name of of the Lord. So the seed of Christianity started with people calling upon God and God answering them and hearing them and 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 blessing them and God would answer them and they would play praise him and worship him and tell other people about the God who answers when you call. Do you know what is real popular right now? in the world is searching out your ancestry. How many have heard of this? Huh? Huge websites, it's a huge business. Searching out your ancestry and searching out even your DNA now. You can swab your cheek, send it in, and they'll tell you what's in your DNA. But for the born-again Christian, your spiritual ancestry is so much more important than your physical ancestry. And for the born-again Christian, what's in your spiritual DNA is so much more important than what's in your natural DNA. Can you say amen? And see, we some in the U.S. like to trace their ancestry back to a Mayflower ship that came across from England, and they take great pride in that. Let me tell you something. They've got nothing on us. We don't trace our ancestry back to a ship. We trace our ancestry back to Genesis chapter 4 when men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Those are our ancestors, praise God. And what was in their spiritual DNA is in our spiritual DNA. And out of Genesis chapter 4 came people like Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah, praise God. Those are our spiritual grandparents. And what was in their spiritual DNA is in our spiritual DNA. And I want you to know, if you're born again here, what's in your, at the core of your spiritual DNA is calling upon the name of the Lord. It's in you, praise God. It's in you. See, people are searching out their natural DNA, saying, thinking, oh, I want to know I want to know if anybody in my life, in my family history was rich. Let me tell you about Abraham and Solomon. 
I want to know if anyone in my family line was a war hero. Let me tell you about David, who won a whole war by killing one giant. Hallelujah. People say, well, I want to know if anyone built anything in my family line. I like to build things. There's any builders in my family line. Let me tell you about Noah, who built an ark and saved the human race. Hallelujah. You know, they say my natural DNA, my natural ancestry is Irish English. Not so bad. But you know what's better than that? Born again. New creation. Child of God. Hallelujah. So don't just identify with your natural DNA. Identify with your spiritual DNA. Don't just identify with your natural grandparents. Identify with your spiritual grandparents. When you read your Bible, those are your people, praise God. Those are your people. Hallelujah. Look with me in Psalm 18. We're going to take a little bit of a Bible journey today and just see what the Lord has to say about calling upon the name of the Lord. We know it started in Genesis chapter 4 when men began. It was the beginning of calling upon the name of the Lord in Genesis chapter 4. And in Psalm 18 In verse 3, David is writing here. Don't you love King David? David was an Old Testament saint, but he was New Testament in his heart, amen? He was a man who lived, um, you know, past past his time. Verse 3 says, I will. Say, I will. This is something you get to, not you have to, but you get to, praise God. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Hallelujah. I'll tell you this, that the Hebrew word there for call and the Hebrew word for call in Genesis chapter 4 means to basically just call out, to speak loudly, to get someone's attention. And probably one of the best examples we have that is in the Gospels when the blind man sitting by the roadside blind called out to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He was obeying what the Bible told him to do, call upon the name of the Lord, and the Bible says that God would answer. And let me tell you something, Jesus being the word himself, answered him. Can you say amen? So I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. You know, David's thought was this. You can chase me, persecute me, try to kill me, but when I call upon the name of the Lord, you guys are done. You guys are finished. Now, some people like to say, well, Pastor, I don't want any enemies. Let me share this with you. Psalm 23 says that God will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. No enemies, no table. (laughs) On that table is blessing. On that table is gifting. On that table is joy and peace and the goodness of God. And if you want the banqueting table of God, you got to have some enemies. Can you say amen? And see, this is how our spiritual fathers operated. They they built, uh, they came into land, and they would build an altar and call upon the name of the Lord. See, their enemies... Our ancestors, spiritual ancestors, enemies, they always had better chariots, better weapons, uh, better soldiers, more soldiers. But Israel was never defeated when they called upon the name of the Lord. Remember the story of Elijah? How that Elijah comes to, it, it, to the, on the scene and Israel is torn between two opinions, whether to serve the Lord God are to, are to serve Baal. Now, Baal has a little bit of an upper hand 
because he's got 450 prophets and versus one Elijah. And Elijah comes on the scene. He comes up to the 450 prophets of Baal, and he says, if the Lord is God, then serve him. Or if Baal is God, then let's serve him. And he says, this is what we're going to do. Let's build an altar, and you get to call on Baal. I'll call on the Lord God. And the God who answers by fire, he will be God. He challenges them to a calling on the name of the Lord contest. Can you say amen? And you'll read at the end of the story that this contest is to the death. The winner lives. The loser dies. But Elijah knew something about calling upon the name of the Lord. So he says, okay, 450 prophets of Baal, you get to go first. Go ahead. I would not have been quite so accommodating. But he lets them go first, and the Bible tells us that they danced, and they shouted, and they screamed, and they called out to Baal all morning long. And finally, Elijah said, enough. Where is your God? He began to mock them. Where is your God? Is he on vacation? Is he sitting on the toilet? The Living Bible says, is he sitting on the toilet? Don't you love the Living Bible? You can get almost anything from it. <laughs> and he says, enough. He says, okay. Your God is not answered. He says, now pour water on the altar. And he calls upon the name of the Lord God. And God answers with fire. Hallelujah. I want you to know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the God who answered by fire thousands of years ago can answer you by fire. Can you say amen? John the Baptist said, I might come. I, he says, he, he says I, I might baptize you with water, but there's coming one mightier than I whose shoes I will... I, I am unworthy to unloosen. He shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire, praise God. Now, some have said to me, Pastor, yeah, but Pastor, we don't need the Holy Ghost to go to heaven. We're well past that. We need the Holy Ghost to go to Walmart. Can you say amen? We need the Holy Ghost. Our problem is not Christians going to heaven without the Holy Ghost. Our problem is Christians going to Walmart without the Holy Ghost, going to school without the Holy Ghost, going to work or the mall without the Holy Ghost. And so God answered by fire. Got any enemies you need to be saved from? Elijah showed us one man who knows how to call upon the name of the Lord. He was one man, but he was not in the minority. You and God are always the majority. Can you say amen? You might be the only, only Christian at work. You might be the only Christian at school. You might be the only Christian in your family. But if you know how to call upon the name of the Lord, you and God are a majority, praise God. You and God are a majority. Let me share this with you about being saved from your enemies. God told Paul when he wanted God to remove something from his life, God said, my grace. God, Paul said, God, can you remove this from my life? God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. When God says, if you'll call upon me, I will answer you, it does not mean he will miraculously Remove something from your life. Psalm 91 says it this way. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him. Say with him. I will be with him in trouble. David said it this way in Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. For you are with me, and your rod and staff, they comfort me. God saves us by being with us. And when he says, if you'll call upon me, I will save you from your enemies, this is how God normally does it. He comes, and he's with us. God delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
in the fiery furnace. Can you say amen? He showed up as the fourth man. God said, save Daniel in the lion's den by showing up as the angel, praise God. See, I run into Christians who are disillusioned with God, lost their hope in God, because they thought God should have removed something from their life. But that's not how God normally operates. How he normally operates is if you'll call upon him, he'll come alongside you. He'll save you in the fiery furnace. He'll save you in the lion's den, praise God. That's what gives him glory. That's what gives him glory. See, God with us in the fiery furnace, in the lion's den, that is the deliverance. That is the breakthrough. That is the miracle. See, if God is for us, who can be against us? Can you say amen? Look with me at Psalm 20. And verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we, we who came out of Genesis chapter 4, we who have ancestors who began calling upon the name of the Lord, we who have calling upon the name of the Lord in our spiritual DNA, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. You know, in this world, there's a lot of different things you can trust. A lot of different things you can put your hope and trust in. But don't forget the name of the Lord. When you call upon the name of the Lord, you are releasing the power that's in your, that name. Proverbs 18.10 18, says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. Once again, when you call upon the name of the Lord, you're releasing the power that's in that name. And God's, God, God, God's word is that he will rescue us. He will answer us when we call upon that name. Look with me in Psalm 50. In verse 15, and call upon me in the day of trouble. Anyone here had a day of trouble? Thank you for those three holy hands. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. And you shall glorify me. I will deliver you. I will answer you. You'll see a theme here. From Genesis to Revelation, God says over and over and over again, you call, I will answer. You call, I will deliver you, praise God. Who are we going to call in the day of trouble? We call upon the Lord God. Can you say amen? We call upon the name of the Lord. See, well, I know this. In the day of trouble, if you will call upon the name of the Lord, I know this, help is on the way. Can you say amen? I know this, that when you call upon the name of the Lord, heaven hears and help is on the way. And my brother and sister, we need help. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, you need help. Now, some of you husbands and wives have been wanting to do that for a long time. You're welcome. We need help. Not just in the day of trouble, we need help every day. I need help to walk in life and life more abundantly. I need help to walk in all the promises that God has got, got for me. I need help to walk in victory. I need help to walk in health. I need help to walk in the blessing of God. I need help. And so I need to call upon the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Look with me in Psalm 80. In 
in verse 18, so will not we go back from the quicken us, make us alive, and we will call upon your name. This is a revival verse. Can you say amen? We are revival people, and this is a revival verse, praise God. And see, there is no revival without calling upon the name of the Lord. Every revival in history has been known by calling upon the name of the Lord. The Welsh revival, the Azusa revival, the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening were all known for God's people calling out to him, calling upon his name. See, revival... And revival is not, Charles Finney told us this, he said, revival is nothing more than a new beginning of obedience to God. And see, in Genesis chapter 4, they had a new beginning of obedience to God. God had told them, they, you can call upon my name. And see, when you have a new beginning of obedience to God, you begin to experience revival. Now, corporate revival is a wonderful thing, but personal revival is just as wonderful. Can you say amen? A lot of times Christians say, well, I think the church needs to be in revival. Yes and amen, but I think you need to be in revival as well. The evangelist Gypsy Smith one time was asked, how can you have revival in every town you go to? And he was standing out in a dirt field, and he took a stick, and he put the stick down on the ground, and he drew a circle around himself. He says, I just have revival in the circle. Can you say amen? And you can have, don't be pointing the finger at the church saying that church needs to be in revival, that pastor needs to be in revival, you need to be in revival. You have revival in your circle, praise God. You have revival in your circle. Charles Wesley said this, he says, I set my, this is how I have revival, he said. He said, I set myself on fire, and I invite the world to come and watch me burn. Can you say amen? And so calling upon the name of the Lord, it's a revival thing. God says, I will revive you, I will quicken you, I will make you alive if you'll call upon my name. Look with me in Psalm 86. And verse 5, for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. How many, how many need the forgiveness of the Lord? Can you say amen? Plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. I tell you, God's got forgiveness and goodness and mercy. Another word for that word mercy would be favor. I don't know about you, but I want all the favor of God I can get. And if you don't want yours, I'll take yours and mine too. And it's, the promise is that if we'll call upon his name, if we'll call upon him, he's got forgiveness and mercy and goodness for us. Hallelujah. See, people say, well, I'm waiting on God. Let me tell you something. God waits on you more than you wait on him. He's got all this goodness. He's got all this forgiveness. He's got all this mercy for us. He just needs us to call. He's waiting on you to call. And you can call any day, anywhere, anyhow you want. I pray you go home after the service today, and I pray before, just when you get in your car, you think, my goodness, I haven't called upon the name of the Lord in this car. I pray you walk into your living room and say, it's been months since I've called upon the name of the Lord in this living room. I pray you walk into your bedroom, into your kitchen today, and you say, my goodness, it's been months since I've called upon the name of the Lord in this kitchen. Is it good to call upon the name of the Lord in church? Absolutely. But what's good in the church is good in the car. What's good in the church is good in your living room, your kitchen, your bedroom. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's got goodness for us. 
Look with me in Psalm 145. So if you need to be saved from your enemies, calling upon the Lord will get the job done. If you need mercy and forgiveness and goodness, the goodness and favor of God, calling upon the name of the Lord will get the job done. Psalm 145 and verse 18. The Lord is near unto all them that call upon him. Wow. See, the news is this. Today, you and I are as close to God as we want to be. Why? Because the Bible tells us that if we'll draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. Can you say amen? That if we wanted to be closer, we would just, it's very simple, we just draw closer. Can you say amen? And Matthew 5, chapter 5 says, God will, God, th- blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That if you're hungry, God will fill you to the level of your hunger. Can you say amen? That's why it's so important that you stay hungry for God. And when a Christian loses their hunger, starts to wane in their hunger, that's that's a warning light. That's like the check engine light in your car that you don't ignore. Can you say amen? And see, God will fill you to the level of your hunger. And God will draw near to you to the level of your drawing near to him. He says here, the Lord is near unto all that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Call, if you want to get closer to God, if you want a stronger relationship with God, calling upon the name of the Lord will get that done as well. Look with me in Jeremiah 33, probably the most known, well-known scripture concerning calling upon the name of the Lord. Jeremiah 33, 3, God says, call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry for great and mighty things that I do not know. There's a lot of things that I do not know But God knows, and he promised that if I would call upon him, he would show me great and mighty things that I do not know. Maybe I don't know how to walk in life and life more abundantly. If I call upon him, he'll show me great and mighty things that I do not know. I don't know how to walk in victory. I don't know how to get my healing. I don't know how to get my deliverance. I don't know how to get my mind renewed. If I will call upon him, he will show me great and mighty things that I do not know. Let me tell you something. Uh, If you will be a doer of God's word concerning Jeremiah 33, 3, I am excited about your future. I am excited about your future. Because if you'll call upon the name of the Lord, you have great and mighty things coming down the pipe the pipeline to you, praise God. Your future can be bright, hallelujah. See, somewhere, if you'll obey Jeremiah 33.3, 3, uh, uh, the Bible, you know, somewhere in the future, your life can look a lot better than it does right now. If you'll call upon the name of the Lord today, your life can look a lot better tomorrow, next week, next month. Because God promised that he would show you great and mighty things that we do not know. He says again, once again, over and over again, if you call, I will answer. If you call, I will answer. Look with me in Acts chapter 2. And verse 11, sorry, verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever, oh, aren't you glad for the whosoever? 
John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever. Now, when God puts a whosoever in a verse, that's like that blank line, that li- blank line in a contract where it says, insert your name here. Okay? And John 3.16 Thank God you're probably here because you got born again. You inserted your name in John 3.16 in the whosoever. Can you say amen? And once again in Acts chapter 2 and verse 21, it shall come to pass that whosoever, say whosoever means me, shall come to that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be saved. Now, I started off sharing with you a Hebrew word for the word call. I'll share with you a Greek word for the word saved. It's the word sozo. You may have heard it. And it doesn't just mean your ticket to heaven. It doesn't just mean your sins are forgiven. It, the word saved there means saved every way that God could possibly save a human being. It's healing. It's deliverance. It's, it's everything that God could possibly do for someone. He put into that word saved, praise God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved shall be healed, shall be delivered, shall be protected, shall be preserved, shall be made whole. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. See, when you call upon the name of the Lord, things began to shift up in heaven. Things begin to change. It's not a natural thing you're doing. It's a spiritual thing. When you call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible promises uh, promises us all through Scripture, God will answer, God will deliver, God will show up. Can you say amen? See, in the Old Testament, Jacob had a ladder. Joseph had a robe. Moses had a rod. Gideon had a sword. Elijah had a mantle, David had a rock, Samson, he had the jawbone of an ass. Let me tell you something, we have none of that stuff. What do we have? We have the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. We have the name of Jesus that is above every name that is named. And Jesus told us his name so we could call upon his name. I know that's deep theology. I am, I, I am college educated, but I do my best to keep it hid. Jesus gave us his name so we could call upon his name. The name of Jesus is above every name that is named. In his name we cast out devils. In his name we lay hands on the sick. In his name we pray and we receive Why wouldn't we call upon that name? Why wouldn't we call upon the name of the Lord? It's a game changer. When you call upon the name of the Lord, it's a game changer, praise God. Why wouldn't we call upon that name? See, the nation of Israel, the people of God, called on the name of the Lord. And when they did, they shook the world. They turned the world upside down. They shook the Roman Empire. There was no lion that could eat them when they called upon the name of the Lord. There was no wall that could hold them. There was no fire that could burn them. There was no flood that could uh, drown them. When they called upon the name of the Lord, there was no giant that could kill them when they called upon the name of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I am sold on calling upon the name of the Lord. 
when God gave me this revelation, I was someone who called upon the name of the Lord. But let me tell you something. When I got this revelation, when God shared this with me, I was like a gambler in Vegas. I am all in. I am all in on calling upon the name of the Lord. I became a calling upon the name of the Lord maniac. And uh, I'm here to raise a few other maniacs. Can you say amen? I'm here to raise up a few other maniacs. See, calling upon the name of the Lord. Noah and David and Daniel and Elijah and Abraham and Jeremiah and others, they called upon the name of the Lord in their time and saw God do great and mighty things in their midst. But that was their time. This is our time, church. This is our time to call upon the name of the Lord in our time and see God do great and mighty things in our midst. Peter, James, and John, the other apostles, the other saints in the New Testament, the early church, they called upon the name of the Lord in their time. But this is our time. Can you say amen? This is our time to call upon the name of the Lord and see God do great and mighty things in our midst. Many times after I'm preaching, someone will come along and say, and it's all good. Oh, that blessed me. And I'll say, that hearing that blessed you? He said, yes. If hearing it blessed you, you should try doing it. <laughs> we, uh, we aren't blessed just in the hearing. Can you say amen? We are blessed in the doing. We are blessed in the doing. Hallelujah. Bow your heads with me for just a moment. And say this with me. Say, Jesus, I've heard your word. I've heard it from Genesis to Acts that if I call, you'll answer. Jesus, help me to be a doer of your word. I covenant with you to be somebody who calls upon the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Trying to run away with that mic. <laughs> well, that good, eh? Yeah. Amen. You know, before we, I just want to just reiterate what Dale is saying. You know, in our society, I'm sure we're on still, uh, I see so many people calling on all these different things. And I've been called a few names lately. But at the end of the day, if you want revival, I like what Dale used that illustration. You know, we keep looking for churches and ministers and music and uh, all these outer expressions of faith to cause revival. But all we need to do is put the circle around us, call on the name of Jesus every day. He says we're seated in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In Jesus we receive all things. The church doesn't need to be a people that demand their rights to worry about their political biases or their medical bias. What we, they need to be is a people that call upon the name of Jesus and that we get alongside of people and help them call upon the name of Jesus. I think in Deuteronomy it says that, you won't get another sermon, I'm just about done. <laughs> I think. Anyways, what time is it? I got a couple minutes. Anyways, but the, the point is, is it says in Deuteronomy, I believe it's in 6, it's probably in 4, and I believe it's in 12. It says that we are to teach our children's children the mighty acts of God and what he's done for us. And the problem with us as God's people sometimes is we worry about what that person's doing. We worry about Blake's revival and Wendy's revival and my revival and everybody else's revival. But God's saying, I'm not worried about Blake and Wendy and Tara Lee and anyone else. I'm worried about you and what you're calling upon. We need to be a church that calls upon the name of the Lord because we have a relationship. And when, you know, don't go light yourself on fire. Hallelujah, that won't do well. Uh, it's hard to restore you when you've done that. 
But at the end of the day, what he's talking about there is we light ourselves on fire by the power of God's Holy Spirit coming upon us. And fire does two things. It's a show, and it cleanses. So if you want, it's interesting, he says that I will bap, he'll baptize you with what? Power and fire. We look at the fire, but what is the fire actually doing? It's cleansing you of your selfish nature. It's washing away all your self motivation and the power comes upon you that you may be go out and be witnesses let's be victory church not because of our title but because we live in victory because of what christ has done let's go out and call upon the name of the lord and call on them when you come along someone that's that's needing a little encouragement you pray with them you know john was sharing at our board meeting how he met a guy that needed prayer so he prayed with them and John's kind of a quiet guy, unlike myself. And, and I thought, but there's the power of God. Evangelism isn't giving the four spiritual laws. It's not going door knocking or standing on the corner. It's smiling at someone. It's saying your name. It's treating them with respect, even if they disagree with you. Even if they, they hate you or they say names about you. And it's praying for them. Evangelism is just getting alongside of people and showing them the love of Jesus. It's living in integrity in our relationship, a revival in our life. Then people will take notice. A lot of people like the churches that are demonstrating right now, and it's drawing a crowd. But that don't do anything for people unless the name of the Lord is brought in in his mercy and his compassion. Because he says we've been, we are ambassadors for Christ to bring reconciliation to a lost world, to our Father in heaven. Let's pray. That's two sermons. How do you like that? You got popcorn. That's why. Anyways, Father in heaven, I thank you for today. Lord God, it's so easy to get caught up in the things of this world and what's happening around us and circumstances. And so, But Father, you're, you're asking us to humble ourselves under your mighty hand that in due time you will exalt us, to cast all our cares upon you, and that you will remove all our anxieties. And as Dale was preaching, that you tell us to draw near to you, and you will draw near to us. Submit to you and, the, and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Father, I thank you for this church, this one arm of your body, Lord, Lord, help us to build up people into you, Lord Jesus, the head of this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Anyways, have a good day, and uh, be blessed, and uh, eat more popcorn. <laughs> Sounds like a game show. <laughs>